This is my Corporation. Inspired, inspired. Okay, uh, we welcome you all on Material and Broadcasting Corporation. Nam Sanje, si sochelo eni, olu shega kulu, which is going to answer uh, one of the most uh, pertinent questions, uh, which was inspired by the state capture report, uh, the South African one, which was handed over to President Cyril Ramaphosa on the 22nd of June. Um, we are going to answer the question, uh, is Zimbabwe a captured state? So we are not just going to talk about the state capture, but we are going to talk about all forms of capture. It could be corruption, it could be judiciary, it could be any forms of capture. Um, this is how the program is going to run. Uh, Dr. Skabate is going to give us a sort of a conceptual framework of what state capture is and all other forms of capture. Then after that, uh, the panelists will engage uh, briefly on what you will have said. <music> then we will go straight to the question, to, to, to answer the question. Uh, then from there, we will talk about the impact, the implications, uh, the consequences uh, of state capture or capture. Uh, from there, we will talk about how to tackle or how to redress uh, the effects of uh, kept Dr. Skabate, over to you, Bob. Nyabonga Ankala, a Angi to moving a letter go won't come on to Guzulu Wonke, Yabalapa, and a Lababaza to go to a logo view at these interesting discussions later on. Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Ngala, for inviting me. It's a, it's a tall order that you gave me, but I am going to engage this topic because it's a topic that is very much um, a, a, an area of interest uh, to me and uh, up my street in terms of my uh, research. I observed that when you were presenting to us what we will be going through, the stages that we will go through as we deliberate on this, that you already have made an assumption that Zimbabwe is a capital state. So I, I, I found that very interesting. And I, I found myself wondering why in the first instance are you then asking the question, is Zimbabwe a captured state? Anyway, allow me to begin by clearly outlining my line of argument and, uh, and my point of enunciation that uh, there is no state in Africa and certainly in the world that is not captured. That I think let us make it as a common denominator and then underlying and underlying it as a statement. I will also in this discussion briefly talk about, well, I will highlight, you may hear certain words, certain concepts that I'll raise, concepts like uh, a patrimonial autocracy concepts such as, of course, the captured state and uh, 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 felonious state. These are all forms of capture. I want us to understand these. But allow me, even if that is the case, to say, as a point of departure and submission, having said that there is no state in the world that's not captured, to continue also to say that Zimbabwe is, in fact, a captured state and has graduated actually to become a, what I refer to as a, a felonia state taken from the concept of felony. I also define state capture as a situation in which decisions are made to appease specific interests. These may even uh, be through uh, illicit and uh, non-transparent private uh, payments to public officials, which we see happening all over Africa, particularly if you look at, at Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe, uh, it's very it's, it's very popular, very common in Zimbabwe. 
Uh, state capture also takes place when the basic rules of the game are shaped by a particular particularistic interests rather than by the aggregated national so-called nationalist interests. In this in this instance, I would like to draw you towards my area, which I'm interested in. That is to present the concept of state capture, Zimbabwe as a felonia state in the captured state, uh, to one uh, and then perceive and present it as one that is whose rulers tend to favor their own ethnic and regional interests rather than the nation or the so-called nation. And I use the word nation loosely here, as you will see later. So the state in this instance, in I argue, is captured by is captured by a specific group of people to further certain or specific uh, ethnic interests. I wish to make also the following observations, following five observations about Zimbabwe as a captured state and the felonious state. And I want to make these observations specifically pointing at the felonious nature of the state in Zimbabwe. That one, these are the observations, five of them. One, and I will speak to them later on. One, a felonious state, in a felonious state, we witness actually the use of party purposes. We witness uh, rather the use for party purposes of the organized state violence by those that are in authority. And of course, the function of such violence uh, is used as an instrument in the service of those in power for their accumulation of wealth. That's number one. Number two, we witness the existence of a hidden ethnic focus collective structure of power that actually surrounds and controls those in the executive authority of the state, which also influences the social construction of the imaginations of the character and identity um, of the, uh, you know, the person who should aspire for the highest office in the land. For example, in Zimbabwe, uh, the uh, popularly held uh, uh, open secret that Ndebele cannot be a, a, a president in Zimbabwe. Um, and, we, 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 and we see this through in ZANU-PF through <coughs> in Chetu mentality, which we also see in the opposition. Uh, it, it's been there for a long time, and now it's even more pronounced manifesting itself as the Wajira mentality. All these are run and mobilized through organized gangs as well, some kind of vigilante. Number three, uh, the third observation is that uh, we also witness the participation of the ruling party as a collective of oligarchs to a certain extent as a form of state capture in criminal economic activities that are carried out with impunity and in collusion with international institutions and systems. I will not discuss much uh, on, 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 on not delve deeper on this thing, number three, uh, for I should say for obvious reasons and also based on where I am. Um, but the fourth aspect is also the fact that we witness the osmosis between a historical con a historically conjured ethnic culture with its specificities as in the case of the Mbuyanehanda narrative, the Swikiro narratives, and other such Sona symbols and cultural repertoires as vehicles for globalizing the Zimbabwe narrative of an, I, I argue, an empty, but very criminal idea of nationhood and uh, national belonging. And then number five, the macroeconomic and macro-political, we observe the macroeconomic and macro-political importance as distinct from the occasional and marginal roles of such practices on the, on the part of those in power and the ruling ZANU-PF and those activities of accumulation that isolate those considered to be minorities. These are the five key issues that I will speak to. And then I will try to focus on the Zimbabwean situation. And I continue to argue that uh, the problem of state capture is a post-colonial uh, African problem. It's a problem with most of, post, of the post-colony in Africa. And in most parts of post-colonial Africa, the birth and the demise of the empire states, obviously as a result of colonialism, paved the way for the states that preferred to be, uh, that pretended to be nation states at, uh, at, uh, you know, at the point of birth during, uh, uh, you know, at their independence. Different states, all of them uh, pretended to be so. And yet what we see is that there are context and countervailing factors and realities are such that 
these are not nation states, but states, in fact. Zimbabwe is a very good example of what pretends to be a nation, but it is actually a state, not a nation. So you may obviously wonder, what then is the difference between the state and the nation? And I would try to unpack this. But to I, I have to unpack this because I've, I've often talked to colleagues and uh, read on Twitter, everywhere, where I read even in the newspapers, journalists presenting Zimbabwe as a nation. Allow me to try and, understand, and, and, and help, help us understand this uh, concept uh, of, particularly the key concept of the nation. To begin with, I want to revisit its, etymo its etymology, the etymology of the nation. Going as far back as the you know 1300, in French uh, dress, uh, you know if you draw it from uh, the French, it's nation, and then Greek Latin, uh, nationem. These concepts, all of them, refer to the same thing: a race of people, a large group of people with common ancestry, language, birth, rank, descents, descendants, uh, relatives, contiguity. That is homeland. And there are you know, so many, but they, do, they still specifically talk about issues of birth, origin, breed, stock, uh, species, race of people, tribe comes in as well. Particularly if you look at uh, it as you draw it from Greek Latin natus, meaning to be born in a specific area within a specific ethnic group. So the term uh, nation when broadly used, it will still refer to a race of people, an aggregation of persons of the same ethnic family, and speaking the same language. So a nation and nationhood imply a substantial level in, 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 in if you like, of cultural homogeneity as, as I've already stated, whereas a, whereas a state and statehood speaks to concentration of sovereignty at the center. And of course, in within a bounded space that is maintained by those, you know, you know, what we call the violent state apparatus, the police, the army, and all other state structures. And then the underlying thread that connects these as, you know, as a thread that weaves between the, the state and the nation is what we refer to as nationalism. But I argue then that nationalism is the board of ideas and values, which may be held by people who are not yet nations. And I, Draw my. I want to draw your attention and my argument from people like Eli Kedori and Ernest Gellner, in particular Ernest Gellner, who simply puts it this way: that nationalism is not the awakening of nations to self-consciousness, but it events nations where they do not exist. So the modern nation-state uh, project, as we know it in post-colonial Africa, was therefore an attempt to merge the two trends. That is the trend towards sovereign political centralization that is statehood, and then the trend towards cultural homogeneity, what we call nationhood. Uh, this is what we see in the ethos of ZAPU and liberation movements all over Africa, particularly if we come closer home in Zimbabwe, we have seen people discussing those. Uh, that was the ethos that ZAPU was pushing. I suppose that was the same ethos that ZANU pretended to be pushing. I therefore have three observations still about those uh, uh, narratives. And I, I want to, mark, uh, to submit these vis the post-colonial African state. That one, uh, when I look at the post-colonial African states as a whole, there are a, a, a close analysis of the of those, particularly during the era of uh, you know, the independence. Francophone African states were nearer to becoming national. Anyway, let me proceed. Sorry about that. Uh, I was about to say, I'm making. I want to also make three observations about these, uh, particularly uh, submissions about the you know the whole statehood and nationhood arrangement and uh, nation state project or compound. Uh, vis the post-colonial states. And I'm trying to drive towards a particular point here. That's why I'm bringing this up. One, that a close analysis of the era of independence uh, shows us that Francophone African states were nearer to becoming nations than the English speaking or Anglophone African states. This is my observation. And uh, two, that Anglophone states were and continue to be further from becoming nations, but have become sovereign states that are captured by ethnic minorities. And we see this in most of these uh, uh, Anglophone states. If you look at even Zimbabwe itself, you look at uh, Nigeria, you look at different other Anglophone states, you will see that. Three, 
I submit that uh, there is a, pre a predicament then that emerges out of this. It is a predicament of captured states that are as a result of the interplay, interplay between the imperial ethnic of which racism is one of its manifestations and the indigenous African ethnicity of which tribalism is one of its manifestations. This is the third aspect. Now, from the observations that I've made, I also argue that those, these post-colonial, uh, that these post-colonial states, the order of them was, uh, if we, the way we see them, were structured following the European contours of the Westphalia uh, models. And this transfer of Europe's state system as a structure to Africa was not accompanied. So now I am also arguing that this, the, the whole problem of state capture that we're talking about is itself a manifestation of so many other things that have happened. And it is, the, it is as a result of the transfer of Europe's state system, which itself was a structure to Africa, presented to Africa, and was not accompanied by any prior calculations to make states would coincide with the nationhood in Africa. And this was also because I argue Europeans of the 19th century believed that Africans had never built nations before, but at best they had tribes. And the Europeans also often continue to affirm that tribalism has always been and continues to be Africa's ban. And this is what we see to this day. So when we talk about the notion of tribe, we refer to the post-colonial Africa, we refer to Africa. But in Europe, they talk about uh, the nation, ethnicity to a certain extent, they don't talk about tribe. Having observed these, allow me then to submit then that uh, Zimbabwe is a captured state immediately graduated, as I have said earlier on, into a felonial state at, in at independence. And I want to try and give examples, specific examples, that people, that my colleagues, my, uh, the panelists here will, I think, I believe as well, they will identify with. Uh, Zimbabwe graduated into a, felonia, to a, to a, into a felonia state at independence and a captured state. Uh, and we have a number of examples that can be stated to confirm this, ranging from the Will of El scandal to Kukuraundi genocide and everything that is continuing to happen now makes Zimbabwe a captured state in the felonia state. But allow me to briefly position this, the image of Zimbabwe as a captured state itself and felonia state. One in which the state is considered, it's, one in which the state considered itself simultaneously indistinguishable from society and the upholder of the law and the keeper of truth. If I may quote from uh, 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 our colleague Mbembe. And, uh, and in this instance, it explains a very scandalous uh, you see in Zimbabwe, one of the scandalous uh, notions that we see, which the state has tried to has put into practice, it is the mantra, the nationalist mantra that said, for the nation to live, the tribe must die. This is the, master, the mantra that the nationalist and uh, liberation movements uh, pervade so much. Uh, in fact, the first proponent of this mantra, I've, I've read from colleagues arguing that uh, the proponent of this mantra was uh, Samora Michelle. No, actually it wasn't, it was Amilka Cabral. So Amilka Cabral was the proponent of this, uh, but when they said for the nation to live, the tribe must die. No one really explained, or even our leaders failed to ask whose tribe must be murdered for this nation to live. Now, if we continue that way, I also argue that Africa state formation project followed a very coercive, particularly when you look at this case of Zimbabwe, very coercive unitary path where no one was invited to state formation to the state formation party, but violently forced to attend. Zimbabwe witnessed this violent uh, episode leading to the uh, formation of uh, what I refer to as a new successor state with the tribalized nationalist leanings. The moment of state capture in Zimbabwe happened uh, on the maternity ward of independence, the scenes of violence we witnessed uh, when Zimbabwe was born, Zimbabwe's violent nationalist streak be buoyed by Zanus Kukura Wundi bloodbath, hyped as the, the triumph of a revolutionary spectacle, tribalized actually and, and, and crystallized the state around the person of Robert Mugabe as a symbol. And also the tribalized state reenacted violent past traces that were perceived as re re retroactively rede redeeming the revolutionary spectacle, actually presented uh, symptoms of failure that captured to, that, that continue rather to haunt 
the state to debt, and many other facets of our lives as we see. The violent process was characterized by sorrowful moments, lamentations and mourning by the vanquished, mainly the people from Matebeleland on the one hand. And then on the other hand, what did we witness? We witnessed the massive euphoric stance, people celebrating as victors who had captured the state and also embarked on a, a war path of rewriting, uh, you know, two aspects. First, the history of the liberation and victory narratives. Second, the configurations of the state and thus turning it into a felonious state. And if, if you look at it closely, in the early 1980s, scenes of the Kukurawundi genocide cast actually a spell on the nationalist project in Zimbabwe by giving way to what, what I refer to as Shona ethno-nationalism. Uh, attempts in this instance to, these were attempts in this instance, I argue, to reposition various phases of Zimbabwe's liberation narratives. And uh, these were made by the, you know, ZANU-PF uh, intellectuals, including the ZANU-PF leaders at independence. And the idea was uh, to deconstruct and discredit the ZAPU uh, liberation narrative, especially Joshua Nkomo's contribution to the liberation struggle. Uh, Joshua Nkomo perceived as a person from Matebele and as a Debele. And that's a new mindset emerged in, in this instance, because the state is captured by this ethno, these Shona ethno nationalists. And then a new mindset emerges in this in which the entire ZAPU leadership together with its military, its military wing, ZIPRA, were presented in the 1980s as dissidents. So we witness also the creation of dissidents. So a state is born and those who capture the state favor a particular narrative that they further. And as Chinua Achebe will tell us, when a leopard wants to feed on its young ones, it first accuses them of smelling like gods. In this instance, the state accuses those that actually fought to liberate it from the zebra part, uh, the zebra element as dissidents in order for it to then turn on, on it and perform felony on them. So Robert Mgabe images in this instance as a, as a symbol of resistance against colonialism and those that are considered as secular uh, colonialists in Debele being included uh, with the re-articulation of the liberation narrative using Shona folklore, canonizing and engraving him in the tablet of time as a Munumutapa reincarnate, if you like. Even official government buildings, interestingly, that housed key members of the executives, that is the prime minister and Kabe's executive. Anyway, I was, uh, I was arguing that, uh, um, I was arguing that uh, even the official government buildings that housed, uh, uh, you know, at independence, key members of the executives, that is Robert Mugabe's executive, him being the prime minister and the entire executive were named after Shona heroes but masked as a decolonial crusade. You see, they dressed themselves in the respectable gaps of, decolonial, of decolonizing uh, or decolonization, but they did not really mean that. So we witness even to this day, the existence of buildings such as uh, uh, Makombe, Makombe building, Monumentapa building and so forth. These were all masks that they presented, but in, in, in actual fact, they pursued not a decolonial uh, narrative or crusade, but they pursued, I would argue, a, a nativist narrative, which was closely imbued and encapsulated within uh, their Shona ethos and Shona narrative. Through this patrimony, and through this, we witness what emerges as a patrimonial uh, uh, state, as well linked to a successor state, a form of patrimonial autocracy, in which even the Ndebele were killed uh, based on the narratives, uh, they were brutally made at based on the narrative that your forefathers came and uh, took uh, beautiful women and all this, you know, that whole uh, uh, narrative and, uh, and lie, which itself is also is an insult to those who are purveying it from the Shona side. Uh, because if you analyze it, if one says you came and captured all beautiful women, it presupposes that those that have birthed them, them now are actually ugly women, such a uh, nonsensical argument. But we witnessed the birth of a patrimonial uh, state, a patrimonial autocracy in which the ethos of the captured state is encapsulated in the Masugiro discourse of the Nakaetu, uh, Mazitate Guru Edu, you know, that whole thing that they always talk. And another thing that even that we find interesting in this whole state capture discourse is that even music 
music by musical groups such as Harare Mambos. I don't know whether people still remember this, but I think my panelists, uh, my colleagues here who are panelists will remember this. Music uh, such a, by groups such as Harare Mambos, the Ran family, and singers like Elijah Mazikatire, uh, I think he was also known uh, as uh, Mgadota and uh, his band, were Harangud to validate this uh, uh, Shona ethno uh, nationalist narrative. And this was as part of the nationalist pantheon. As part of their nationalist pantheon, music and other such activities were used to capture a definitive state of a tribalized historical continuum in which Shona memory and its narratives were presented as official history, historiography as well. If you look at uh, the Zimbabwe bed, which is a Hungwe, uh, if you look at uh, the Zimbabwe ruins, and many other such narratives. So the Harare Mambo's band, for example, celebrated Robert Mugabe's rise to power in their hit song of the 1980s. Those of us who were uh, young at the time, but I think conscious, uh, would remember uh, the song, Mugabe Bazotonga, which if literally fumbled would mean Mugabe has finally become the leader, something like that. And they celebrated also the cockerel as the symbol of ZANU-PF with Mugabe as the leader. Of course, I think they also had uh, lessons that they had learned from people like Mobutu Seseko, who actually called himself, Christened himself as Mobutu Seseko Kukungwend, which means the cockerel among chickens. So the nationalist hero's echo also in this instance is constructed as the national shrine. So you imagine this is a captured state. I'm, 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 I'm painting a picture of a capture of how a state is captured and how a captured state co uh, creates a continuum and and, and, and leaves it within it. So you imagine here the narrative of a, a national shrine being constructed with its, with its wall actually showing an engraving of Robert Mugabe as the leading visionary, you know, with a concourse of followers in the so We witnessed the construction of a national shrine, what is considered as a national shrine with the wall, with the wall showing an engraving of Robert Mugabe as the leading visionary with a concourse of followers in the background. Another historical figure in this instance is, is constantly smuggled in the narrative of the state. Uh, that is Mbuyane uh, Handa, celebrated even by the Harare Mambo's band as the, spirit, as the spirit medium who prophesied the liberation uh, movement, its ethos, and of course, the coming of age of uh, this uh, liberation narrative. So you see Mbuyane Handa is presented as a, as a prophet and many other Shona Sukiros. Her prophecy of the liberation struggle is re-narrated and granted an appropriate and an, an appropriated rather meaning of events and at, at independence. This is what we witness. So at the end of it, what do we witness? We witness the re-narration of memory of of memory that had a bearing on the consolidation of Zimbabwe as a successor state. Uh, of course, based on the imagination of the Mutapa state. So those who captured the state in Zimbabwe obviously imagined themselves uh, or uh, tried to produce a state that was attempting to be a compound that embraces the modern knowledge systems on the one hand uh, of, from the departing colonialists or colonial administrators. And on the other hand, uh, they are shown an ethnic narrative of what a, mode, of what a, a Mutapa state was like. So they, com uh, so they conflated the two and produced the Zimbabwe that we have today as a patrimonial state on the one hand, a, fel a felonious state on the other hand, and of course, overall as a captured state. In this instance, at the center, the ideology of it is Shona nationalism, with, with Mugabe having gained psycho-spiritual powers and connection to the Mutapa state. So this is what we have in a nutshell. Allow me to end okay, here. No, th and thanks I'll... very, very much, uh, Dr. Skabate. Uh, let me come to uh, Dr. Njovu. Do you have anything uh, that you'd like to add or subtract on what Dr. Skabate has just shared with us. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Babunka. I hope you can hear me. Yes, yes. Yes. 
And once again, thank you again to Babus Kabate and every member of the panel. Yes, um, thank you very much indeed for the historical foundation and the conceptual foundation that you have given us uh, in connection with the nature of this state that we call Zimbabwe. Uh, indeed, uh, I wouldn't add more, if, especially if I look at uh, uh, the, the issue that institutions uh, as the, the very uh, organs of the state that one would think about were already captured by the time uh, we come to 1980. So it goes without saying that uh, indeed the capture took place a, a, a long time ago at the commencement of, of this the life of this creature called Zimbabwe. Uh, what uh, came uh, sorry, to my mind was that if, if this state uh, capture had already taken place by 1980, by the time uh, you know people began to celebrate that independence, we noticed that there were people, as I have already said, who were enjoying it at some point, but there has been a, a progressive slide to a point where even those who once enjoyed some glory in Zimbabwe have finally lost it because now it is controlled not even by ZANU PF, not even by the government, but it has fallen into the hands of a few. I think that's where I would like uh, to, to place emphasis that the institutions that once were, of course, some of, in fact, a lot of the people in this panel would agree with the fact that uh, maybe they were not among those that were enjoying the fruits at some point, but at least there was a point when others were enjoying it. Uh, the, the reference to Kukura Undi, it gives uh, a credence to the fact that those in my and, and elsewhere were already feeling the brunt of, uh, you know, the wrath of this captured state. But if you look at, again, the Wheel of Gage scandal, which was mentioned earlier, uh, I, I always want to look at the reaction of the, the then, was it president or he was prime minister at that time? I can't remember. But he quickly instituted a commission of inquiry under Wilson Sandura, because at that point, there was still a semblance of, of fear and a respect for the people. Because you see, thinking about the state, maybe conceptually one would think of it as a what a contractarians have always called as a, an entity that comes about as a result of a tacit agreement between the population and those who are then vested with power. And then you find that uh, the relationship continues on the basis of uh, that tacit agreement whereby the, the population lend their uh, authority, and rather they lend their allegiance uh, to those who are then vested with power, who in turn make a pledge uh, to, 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 to protect the welfare and the interests of the majority. So in, in that case, through that uh, metaphorical you know, contract, one would expect that even within the concept of uh, that captured state as Wabus Kabate has referred to, there should still be a kind of respect for that social agreement. Uh, you would, like I have mentioned the, the Willow Cat scandal and I said there was still a semblance of respect, a semblance of fear, uh, considering uh, that maybe people will one day bring the government to account. So even the, 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 those early commissions like the Chihambakwe, the Tumbuchena, which were meant to investigate Kukuraundi, though we know that uh, eventually the, the, their, their reports were never publicized. But that was a reaction based on the fact that at that time, the, the, the institutions of government had not you know, established that stranglehold on the, the, the institutions the parastatus as we see it now, whereby you find that uh, parastatus like uh, Zupco or the Grain Marketing Board uh, are actually now beholden to certain private interests where we now hear about uh, the Queen Bee and the, the Tagires have enjoying that exclusive control 
over the institutions and apparatus of the state. So I, I would say, uh, whilst with, uh, without discounting what Tubabus Gabade has said, I want to add uh, that uh, the, 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 the continuity and the progress of this capture has moved from a point whereby maybe a certain ethnic group seemed to enjoy, but now we are at a point whereby the ethnic group itself, even ZANU-PF as an institution, has actually lost control of the state. Because now it is only a small niche of people. It is only those that are connected, those that have access to control of fidelity printers and refiners. So that you find a, a situation whereby the gold, all the gold resources in the country now go through one conduit. They now belong to one person. They now belong to one family. So in that case, I would say, yes, indeed, the state has always been captured, but the level of capture has reached a crescendo. It has reached a level where by now, it is this, this whole institution called Zimbabwe is only at the service of the few who are actually at the top. And maybe I was going to also mention the issue of, uh, I always want to talk about the, the military. There's a, there's a very interesting uh, revelation that came up in 2017 when Chiwenga was addressing the army just before the, 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 the coup that was uh, staged. He actually indicated without expressly admitting that uh, the, the Zimbabwe National Army as we know it has never been a national army because he actually highlighted that uh, he gave a narrative that in the, in the 1970s, when, they were, when ZANU PF was exper experiencing problems in Mozambique and in Tanzania and so on, the army came in to put them back in, 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 into, into rather to, to redirect them. So he then compared the 1970s uh, role of the army with the role that he was about to take. And for me, that reminded me of the fact that an institution such as the Zimbabwe National Army has never been a national army in the first place. It has always been a Zandla. So what then happened in 1980 was a transplantation of Zandla from Mozambique, and then a, a renaming it and a rebranding it as a Zimbabwe National Army. But that explains why when it had become very clear around 2008 that Woken Changirai was about to win, they they, they, they came up in the open, the, 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 the members, the generals, and said, no, even if you win, we are not going to support you. We are not going to salute you. So that is a clear indication that this thing called Zimbabwe is not serving the people. The social contract, in fact, I would be wrong to say the social contract collapsed because it was never established. As Ubabu Skabate said, people were just brought in into the party to celebrate what they had not really been uh, involved in the formation of. So even the attempt to, 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 you know, maybe forge a social contract by adopting the 2013 uh, constitution, you, you find that by 2017, again, the, 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 the executive is overthrown through a coup. So that on its own then indicates that, uh, uh, the, the, the social contract is no longer in operation. And then 2018, we have uh, people electing their members of par parliament, and then a plan is hatched through lawfare, and then the, the, those MPs are expelled from parliament under what is called, uh, what you call this, this, this party recall system. So those are some of the issues or indicators that highlight the fact that Indeed, we are dealing with a captured state that is not serving the interests of the people, but is saving the private interests of those that control it. Thank you very much. I think I can stop there for the time being. Okay, no, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Angel. Thanks a lot. Uh, Mr. Moyo, uh, do you have anything to add on what uh, Dr. Skabate uh, shared with us? And maybe to also answer the question, is Zimbabwe a captured state. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ngala. <clears throat> and also, 
Uh, thanking uh, all the participants here and the panelists as well, and also uh, welcoming um, a, a very clear and concise uh, uh, submission by Babus Kabate Rapana. That was uh, very um, clear in terms of highlighting the issue of the state capture here uh, in Zimbabwe. Uh, I also concur with um, what um, Dr. Skabate has said, and also what um, uh, Dr. And uh, uh, here is also highlighted, also concurring with what uh, Skabate said. Look, uh, if, if we are looking at Zimbabwe, as you are already saying it, that Zimbabwe is a, a state that is captured. We are also going to look at some of the submissions that have actually been uh, brought forth here. Uh, if we're looking at a state capture, we're looking at a scenario whereby it deals with the business, it deals with the politics, and also with the state. So those are three major uh, branches which normally get captured, and hence here by politicians for their own um, <clears throat> benefits and also to further their own interests. I'm sure there's Kabate made it very clear that uh, there is an element of uh, particularistic interest <clears throat> that come into play when it's the issue of uh, state capture as well. Also <clears throat> highlighting the issue of uh, the need to accumulate wealth at the same time deriving a, a divide and rule tactic uh, in the process to try to come up with a system of, 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 a, of a control of some sort. And then also we see the, oli the oligarchs and also cartels that come into play. This is a reality that we see in Zimbabwe. I'm sure in 2021, there was a report that came through uh, the Maverick report, uh, the Daily Maverick from South Africa. They published a report of um, some of these um, uh, cartels that are there in Zimbabwe and how they have been benefiting and looting out the state, whereby even the president himself, uh, Emerson Nangaka, was also implicated as one of the people that are feathering <clears throat> all these uh, corruption, uh, corrupt activities that are happening uh, in the state. So if we're looking at this, uh, I, I want to touch a little when it comes to these three aspects here. The tribal capture, which uh, Dr. Skavat actually alluded to and also emphasized, especially on ethnicity uh, grounds, and also the political capture as well, which is also uh, very important. We're looking at Zimbabwe as a command country. Uh, there is command politics, there is command economy, there is command state. The state being how they command the people. They want everyone to toe the line. They don't want any dissenting voices. Anyone who's opposing is, is regarded as an enemy. But I want to be a little bit particular in terms of our strike against the people of uh, Matebele. That is um, to us. <clears throat> as he has already alluded to that uh, from 1980, there was already a grand plan that was uh, structured as a way uh, to deal with the issues of material aid. Uh, either they were looking at it historically to say uh, Zilingas came here and did this. That's the argument that even today they, they, they keep bringing up to say Zilingas came here and started plundering and taking cakey and taking wives and so on. But if you get deep into what they're saying, there's really no relevance at all. It's just an issue of hegemonic uh, tendencies to try to establish uh, Shona as a system that is in control of the whole of Zimbabwe. If you look at it from the grand plan perspective, uh, that was authored before 1980, which is 1979, as a way to, to structure as how they would control uh, the whole country uh, ethno based to say, to limit the power of the people of Matebele land. And I'm sure they were deriving it, taking it from how they had seen a, a, a party like Zapu and an and, 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 and army like Zipra, how powerful they were. Uh, we, you will trust they can see that they were advised to know which the only way to limit these people will be either to capture them and to capture their systems and to reduce them uh, to, to ensure that they do not have that leverage uh, to be able to continue and, and build up a nation. I'm sure Skabate uh, mentioned that, that Zimbabwe is just a state, it's not a nation, because if it was a nation, it was going to be very comprehensive and also uh, accommodating to everyone. So from uh, the tribal uh, capture point of view, we are looking at the Shona Hichimon, whereby systematically everything is now favoring the people from Mashona Lid, which actually has made all the institutions to be captured. And then it gives us a, an institutionalized tribalism within the country whereby even a person 
who does not know much about what happened later or uh, long, long day in history, automatically they are favored by the system to just fit into the system automatically. That's I always say that he has got 15 points, earlier 15 points, and the RA is from a table and has got a Mandebele name. The other one is coming from a journal and has got 15 points. Automatically, we're going to ask to apply. Systematically, the Ndebele person is given a second option, and the shorter person is given the first option. So tribal, in tribal terms, some, ap some applies to employment. You apply, you push your CV, the other one pushes their CV. The fact that they are shorter, they are really considered. I remember when I went for attachment in NRZ, I'm sure it was somewhere there around the, uh, 2001, two, somewhere there. I, I, I had gone for an attachment there. The first thing when I came in there, the foreman who was the foreman there asked us if we, we all can speak shorter. That was in railways day in Bulawat. He asked us if, can we all speak shorter? I said, I don't speak shorter. He said, why? I said, why should I speak shorter? I said, Shona is a national language. So he said to me, you should start now making sure that you learn what? Sean. So to a certain extent, I was like, so why this person is in Bulawayo and is in control of NRZ in Bulawayo and is insisting that everyone who's supposed to come in here is, is expected to speak shorter. You see, those are hegemonic tendencies that are already supported by the system to enable everyone who's coming from Ashura, meaning that if we're applying, if I couldn't uh, answer some of the questions in Shona in an interview, definitely I wasn't going to be considered for the position to get the point. So those are the things that I'm trying to, 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 to bring here to say, if we look at it is systematically uh, 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 even supported. I'm sure we all remember the likes of NH Mtoto was the Minister of Information then, uh, who actually said in the are, are, are foreigners actually from South Africa. And he, he went with that and, and, and no one actually condemned his statements. Even the, the, the president himself had nothing to say uh, to even make him to apologize to the people, but that was sending a message to say the state is actually supporting this. We saw also uh, some time back even uh, this Holland, uh, Sakai Holland, also said to the same sentiments when he said the millions were taking wrestlers and so on. And then we also heard Umtwanga, Umonika Umtwanga one day when she was talking, saying the Ndemelez are the minority, uh, what you call this, Russia's minority and so on. Those were some kind of sentiments that are actually intonating to to, to create a certain element about the people of material and to say they really do not belong uh, in Zimbabwe. And hence someone asks, so do we really belong there in Zimbabwe? So systematically, every institution and everyone has been captured to point that the people of material needs to be sidelined in almost everything. Even Munangakwa himself, we hear him past uh, sentiments that has been uttering, saying everyone, anyone who is going to be talking about the issues of um, Chavazi will get their lives shortened. Those are the kinds of uh, things that we see that are being promoted by the government itself to, institute, to institutionalize uh, tribalism and then also enhance marginalization. Hence, we see millions of our people have been uh, structurally pushed out of the country. And then many of them now, millions of them now are in neighboring countries, some overseas. Uh, it is because of most and many of those uh, issues. Then we look at the political aspect, which is the capture, which uh, actually is the one that is affecting us a lot. Because on the political aspect, that's a regulatory capture, which uh, we are talking of, whereby there's some element of agency capture or a form of corruption of authority, whereby everyone within the authority politically is empowered to be able to defend the system. So we're looking at that, uh, creating certain entities, uh, and then we look at it from the policy making point of view. I remember uh, if we now look at the bureaucratic bureaucratic element of how Zimbabwe is run. The Politburo, which is the ZANU PF element, nonetheless, even if they may not be in, in, in ministerial positions in the government, they are the ones actually that are influencing everything that is happening within the parliament because everything is planned today. I remember a few weeks ago, the Speaker of Parliament raised an issue of uh, the diaspora vote when he actually highlighted and said, uh, there is a need to look into the diaspora vote. And the, the comments that followed after he was sat down and he was lectured to say, why would you raise such a point which we had not? Discussed as, as the 
police or political thing at also the political uh, parties whether it's political Political parties they are formed. We are looking at Zanu PF. They have been struggling to ensure that uh, at least uh, there is one party state from 1980, and then either way they came up with the socialists have an opposition. But if you look at the opposition itself, the MTC when it was formed, there is also that element that is running within Zanu PF that is also running within main opposition parties that are, are national. Gibson uh, in the formation of that of, of MTC was supposed to be the president. Uh, but there were some, Dr. Uh, Hattel. Dr. Hattel, some questions, Bob. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you, Babunkala, and thank for the presentation, uh, Dr. Mshanga, uh, and the fellow panelists, uh, Dr. Nzobu and Ubabu Moyo. I thank think you. the comments that have been raised are, are very very useful and interesting indeed. As you said in your opening remarks, uh, Mr. Kala, that uh, you are drawing this from the example in South Africa. And with that background, perhaps it's important to note that those who fed to the concept of, of, of step capture in the South African context actually called it the corporate capture of state, which meant here we bring in the role of the private players, the companies, and the like. And I would agree with uh, Dr. Skavad uh, that the issue of state capture is a matter of, of degrees, I think I should say, well, you didn't put it that way, that all, all states are captured in a way. So. I think if we look at the Zimbabwean situation, it's important that we look at our own context, we look at our history, and we look at uh, where we are and why we might think uh, Zimbabwe is a capture state or is not a capture state, depending on on where you 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 really uh, stand. Before perhaps maybe coming to some of the points that I think might uh, strengthen the, the, this discussion. Perhaps I go back to what Dr. Uh, 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 Skavate raised, which is very important for us to, to engage. I, I, I found it very, very interesting, uh, the, the issue of coming to the etymology of, of the nation uh, and, and perhaps distinguishing it from, from, from the state, but perhaps zeroing in on the nation, especially uh, the post-colonial uh, 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 states in Africa. I would pose this question, uh, 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 Doc, for you to, to perhaps even elaborate further, it perhaps will, 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 will help us in a way uh, to say, if what we have in Africa does not reflect uh, the ideal of what a nation would be. Do we have any nation anywhere in the world? Because all nations, in my view, and what other writers have said, uh, are actually creations by the people, by the writers, by the artists, by uh, the uh, musicians. You know, it's the, the, the concept of a nation itself is imagined. Uh, hence, it would be very interesting to trace whether is there really anywhere a country where there is a, a congruence between the nation and the state where one ethnic or racial group with one language, with one uh, uh, history, with a common ancestry, and it has its own state. And uh, perhaps I tell you that or, or put just suppose that and think of the possibility of a multinational state. Is it not possible in the post colonial, including in this situation, to have a multinational state if we take the state as an organ uh, through which uh, we navigate and the regulate uh, power and distribution of, of resources? So I, I thought that would be. A very interesting. I bring this because if you also go into history, you realize that uh, 
the nation building has always been a, a longer process in, 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 in all countries that at a certain point achieved uh, their status uh, or a, a nation. So the building of a nation is an effort. And I would say perhaps in the Zimbabwean situation, those who had authority, those who had the opportunity to build a nation, it was possible to build a nation in Zimbabwe, but perhaps they failed, perhaps they had different agenda. Uh, if you can cite uh, one uh, Italian unifier who said, we have built Italy, but now we have to build Italy. So the question of nation building, you go out of your way to, to bring, to harness harmony, to bring that sense of citizenship, to bring that sense of belonging. And there are many ways of doing it, which I would agree that uh, the Zimbabwean uh, leaders, as it were, perhaps failed in that respect at this man. And also, I like the point you raise that uh, uh, citing uh, America on the issue that for the nation to live, the tribe must die, and the whole tribe must die. I, I, I thought the, you, you'll go further on that one and, and bring that. But I thought perhaps you will also come to the concept, since we have cited the issue of the historical aspect, Zapu, Zanu, and the like, and say, perhaps you could also elaborate further to say, even before Zanu took over in 1980, there was this push to unite the Zimbabwean uh, 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 liberation movement. And uh, this push even came from, from the OAU, from the so-called frontline states. If you look at the projects like ZIPA, Patriotic Front, and, but we don't see uh, this pressure with the ANC and PAC in South Africa. We don't see this pressure with the MPLA and the UNITA, uh, and the like in Angola, but in Zimbabwe, it, 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 it was a problem we wish we thought perhaps it can be interrogated further. It can uh, uh, give us uh, more to, to, to see why was this pressure for, 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 for a single, for a unified, for a oneness from, from the start, which of obviously Zanu took advantage of and the being from the majoritarian point of view and using ethnicity, as you rightly point, obvious, the power is going to go to them if you use the census uh, part of it. But also, uh, perhaps Dr. Ndob cited, I would have loved, Dr. Skabat, for you to come more also on the role of the deep state. We know that part of the problems of Zimbabwe have been the overreaching of the deep state the securocrats, the military, which uh, other writer that I generally have talked about, the politicization of the military, and the, as well as the militarization of the state organs, which I think if we are to come back to the issue of whether Zim is a, a captured state or not, first of all, we realize that the military in Zimbabwe is pervasive, is actually in every sector. So that becomes interesting, even if you are saying, is it a question of the corporate a capture of the Zimbabwean state? You ask yourself, who owns those companies? Be they mining companies, be they manufacturing companies, be they trading in what? Who owns those companies? If you come to the control of the organs of the state, the parastatals, who controls, who controls uh, those uh, various organs? Because when we, we look at the, the concept of the capture of state, we are also looking at the weakening of the organ of state that should be uh, having checks and balances. The way states are structured is such that there should be checks and balances in the legislature, the judiciary, the executive and the like. But we are saying when the state has been captured, these organs, first of all, are weakened and they are not able to do the checking. So that, that is part of the characterization to say, is a state a captured or not? Are the organs able to do what they are expected to do or they are meant to do? So those are some of the things perhaps 
that we would want to see uh, to say even the ethnic uh, hegemony or capture, if we were to put that way, what exactly facilitates it? Is it not that those who control the instruments of violence are the ones who actually uh, are the masters behind whatever could be happening? And perhaps as you noted also the issue of uh, that the state was captured, if it was captured at all, uh, the characteristics of, of, of capture could be observed right at independence. And then you, you say that seemed to be a shared uh, experience in Africa, but it also makes us to reflect to say, uh, what are we saying about the, the colonial uh, state, which totally excluded the indigenous majority and the, a few people really control the state for their benefit as, 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 a, as an exclusive racial group. So we, we want to interrogate this from the historical side to say, what makes African states and a Zimbabwean state in particular vulnerable to capture if we agree they are captured? We know this concept was popularized after the fall of the Soviet Union and the emerging states that this idea of uh, this level of corruption that people felt it goes beyond the, the normal bribe and, and, and the like things we know to, to the level of state capture. And now when we uh, just oppose it and they see it in the African context, we find this pervasive nature and it's very, it would very key for us to really interrogate it further from the historical uh, uh, origins of the modern states of Africa that were a colonial creation. Since in your the presentation, Dr. Mzana, you really took us back in his, which is very important for us to, to have this background in terms of uh, where we are coming from, what are the possibilities, what trajectories were taken, and where we are as of now. But then perhaps I wouldn't go further uh, before I conclude just to, to raise uh, some of the, of the issues that uh, might be of interest when we, we, we talk of, of this topic. And uh, well, I've mentioned the, the, the role of the securocrats, the deep state in this open context, which is a, a key player. Uh, but also to interrogate the relationship between the private sector and the public sector. As we know that what has been considered the national interest in our context has tended to be uh, privatized. It has, to be, it has been a personalized interest where the state no longer serves citizens holistically, but it serves certain interests. Then that's where you can say these are signs or features of capture, where you cannot say, I'm not sure whether I can get justice here. I'm not sure whether I can go and report that to the police uh, station, whether this judge who stands before me, will he or she uh, dispense justice in a fair uh, man? Those are the questions in my view that I feel as we interrogate, they will show that something is not right uh, in, in Zimbabwe. And when we discuss the issue of state capture, we also cannot rule out the level of corruption. You know, corruption has become endemic in, in Zimbabwe. And, and that part obviously makes it very, very vulnerable to, to, to the capture where uh, criminal elements, gangs organized, uh, criminals control uh, certain organs of the state, be it the executive, be it the judiciary, be it uh, the military, as it were. And that way, you are saying, as long as a, a, a country is failing to deal with uh, corruption, it allows corruption to institutionalize and again root and become the order of the day, that state is, is it vulnerable, is susceptible to, to, to capture. So if one looks at, I don't want to 
to, to declare or state whether Zimbabwe is captured or not. But I think when we do the characterization, it's easy for people to say uh, whether it is captured, if it is partially captured, if, it's, if there's a concept of that, but at least we, we can see that generally uh, corruption is very, very uh, uh, pervasive and, and so much uh, has been said about it and there seems to be either no ability or no political will to, to reduce it, to arrest it. And that also gives questions to say, is this really state not captured? Are those who are supposed to be authority, are they acting in their own will or they are acting under certain forces that are, are behind them? So I think for now, those are my uh, few inputs. Thank you, colleagues. Okay, no, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Hade. Um, I, I will ask Dr. Msanga um, to engage uh, your points, your questions. But first, let me go to uh, Dr. Mkuni, uh, your contributions. Um, I will go on this principle. It's going to be two or three minutes. But uh, if something has been said, don't say it, particularly if you're not going to do it as well as the people that have gone before you. Every time I am asked to appear with uh, Dr. S uh, uh, Skabate, I'm excited because of the depth of his knowledge in these particular things. Well, those that don't know my background is um, uh, in science and therefore I'm really spring chicken when you are in this field. But uh, notwithstanding that, I will humbly sort of put another perspective, just a different point of view. I know that we're focusing on Zimbabwe. And uh, Dr. Kabate said uh, that, uh, you know, state capture is something that there's possibly no state that is not captured. Now, if you look at what state capture really is, the systematic political corruption in which private interests significantly influences a state's decision making. Now, if you put it like that, we're gonna finish this in one just first line. Yes, of course, is state captured. Now, the perspective that I'm going to give that is different than the very, very informative uh, contributions that have been made by the panelists. I'm actually citing Dr. Skabate because we have actually participated and presented. I've been there learning a lot from what he's got to give because it is his field. But I'm going to give a different perspective in this way. Now, um, state capture is an, an ongoing fight between the private interests and those that actually rule. If we look at how we arrived at where we are, we can go back. I think that. The panelists have said that post-colonial, as just a common person, a common man, I would say it was state capture existed well before that. Now we can go back as far as Harold Macmillan, when he said the winds of change are blowing across Africa. He was not talking about the emancipation of the Africans. He was saying, if we go back to the Berlin conference, and what is intended for Africa. But beware, we could be losing what the Berlin Conference was all about. The Berlin Conference was that it sought to discuss the partitioning of Africa, establishing rules to amicably divide resources among the Western countries at the expense of the African people. Now, and the Western world wouldn't have rushed to give the Africans the independence, if that independence didn't benefit, reverse the benefits that we're gonna get from them. Now, of course, the states are going to be captured, the levels of capture are going to vary according to the prevailing conditions in that particular state. Zimbabwe as a state is ripe for state capture. Now, you look at what is prevailing. Zimbabwe is a one center of power 
state, if state or nation, or whatever you want to call it, that really is ripe for people that want to take advantage of whatever the resources are. If we were to look at that, it's argue, arguably, Zimbabwe would be one state that could exist without having to actually look for anything from outside the state. You look at what actually happened before independence with Smith running that, the, uh, the, 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 the show and how it could survive and then immediately after how it has collapsed to what it is. It is because the prevailing conditions are so fertile for those who want the private interests to exploit than possibly anywhere else in the world. I'm reminded, I'm old enough to remember, um, there was a Professor Bone who was the Professor of Education at the University of Rhodesia, or the University College of Rhodesia. And he said something that has stayed with me for a long, long time at the graduation. And he stood up and said, there are people that say that our African graduates are not clever. I disagree with that entirely. Our African graduates are very clever, but their white counterparts are wiser. And I think what is happening, what actually has led to where we are with the state capture, with the interest that actually was engendered in the Berlin conference, the state capture is the people that we are looking at are also just victims. They are cogs in this particular big wheel that actually wants to exploit it to the maximum. The lesser the number of people are beneficiaries, the better it is. I'll cite other examples. You look at people like Umaru Diko from, uh, from uh, Nigeria as an example. You look at Mobutu Sese Seko. These people are, the, uh, are examples of what happens in an African context where people, people leading them are stupid or they are so gullible or they are actually so easy to corrupt. If you just say we went to our chair now and I said I wanted to capture and we think that he's going to be the president next time. And I just slide a million pounds under the desk and I say now, when you become the leader of your country, you do this for me. The people that are benefiting from the state capture, the main benefits would be amazing that you look at London, you look at uh, Washington, you look at the people that are benefiting maximally are people that are really, um, the, the, the top relays, if I can mention the name like that without being sued for libel, they are only minor players in this. The problem is much, much bigger. When I have been engaging, I think I actually go, going to the, even the people that we thought supported our struggle with Russians. They said that we supported your party at the time that was self-interest. The interests of state capture are way beyond the people that are actually practicing it. They benefit along the way, but certainly with what we've got in our country, in Zimbabwe, the state capture is right up to the, uh, it does, sorry, I'm, I need to finish the sentence because I need to, sort of go uh, uh, not particularly well. But if you look at the likes of Nangako, if Nangako went to these bosses tomorrow and said, I've had enough of this, I want to move away from it. I'm sure they would just say, you know, you're going nowhere because his position, his being there is to benefit them. The state capture would not allow them. These guys are filthy rich, the riches that they have. They don't need, you look at Mobutu Sese Seko, how long has he been dead? And they still steal $60 billion of Mobutu Sese Seko money still sort of lolling around in Switzerland. Yeah, okay. So the answer to has, is Zimbabwe, is sort of the capture saying, of course it is. And the capturing 
Unfortunately, I know that it is depressing to actually sort of consider this. You look at uh, Chamiso saying that I'm going to change the trajectory of the country. That's rubbish. Immediately, he goes in and actually assumes power. The bosses at the top that are responsible for that state, state capture will read the riot act to him to say, this is what you follow, because that's the advantage that they want perpetuated. Now, if you want to break away from that state capture, what happens to you? Look at what happened to Muammar Gaddafi. Look at what happened to Patrice Lumumba. And you'll know how shackled these states are. The people that maybe were able to break out of state capture to a certain extent are people like Lee, Lee, Lee Kuan Yi, is it, of Singapore. And even then, maybe the advantage that he had at the time was that there was not that much resource for the state capturers to try to keep in place. You look even at uh, Deng Xiaoping, whatever, of, of, of China. Now, the way that he was able to actually get his country slightly out of state capture was because of the complexities. And I think that our educated can actually say, why were these people able to come out of that nebulous web of state capturers? The state capture in our country is real because we do not have the institutions that could fight that state capture. And even if we have the institutions, the institutions themselves, the power to actually break out of that nebulous web of state capture would make it mighty difficult. Even my dear friend, uh, Dr. Skabaje, if you were to be president tomorrow, I wouldn't hold any help for Zimbabwe coming out of state capture because unfortunately they would actually read the riot act. Your role is you would be exceedingly rich yourself as a person. Or if you do not want to follow the line, you're gone. Like what happened to Patrice Lumumba? We have state capture. Yes, I do not know. Unfortunately, I've got to go now because I really am ailing. Is there a way that we can break out of that actually sort of the spider's web? My, I, I, if somebody said to me, Ralph, you are going to be the president of Zimbabwe tomorrow, <laughs> run am I? Because it really is a toxic environment to be in. Friend, thank, thank you, Chair. Sorry, very much, uh, Dr. Mkoni. All right. Mm. Um, we'll let you go because we know you. you're not feeling very well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, Dr. Skabate, um, Dr. Hadev raised uh, quite a number of issues. Uh, I hope you still remember them. Uh, if you can engage them, please. Uh, thank you, Oyane. Yes, I, uh, I do remember them. I took note of that and I uh want to say salutations to my brother it's been a while since we last communicated uh, myself and my brother uh, dr hatebe by the way i must also state that dr hatebe is my teacher uh, this must be known uh, and underlined by the way and put in bold I, I really enjoyed all the questions that he raised and i hope i will be able to engage them uh, in full and in great detail but before I engage what uh, uh, Dr. Hadebe raised, allow me to, I hope he is still here to engage also uh, the last speaker's submissions, my brother, Dr. Nkuni. Um, he raised a, some, a number of very interesting points and I will really do my best, uh, try my best to engage them. Uh, of course, a few others, he talked about uh, he actually touched on the issue of the deep state, which Hadebe, uh, Dr. Hadebe talked about, and also the whole idea of uh, 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 the state being captured to the point that even an individual, he gave an example of me, if I was to become a leader um, uh, in, say, in Zimbabwe, and then the fact that I could also be captured. Um, and then he also stated the fact that the state itself and the leaders now are actually shackled to the states they, that they created. That's what I wanted to emphasize, to, to talk about. And the, he gave the example of the 
the Democratic Republic of Congo, formerly Zaire, and gave the example of um, uh, Lumumba. I want to state that from the onset, uh, I would have loved to talk more about this historical narrative that I was trying to present. Lumumba became a victim of, uh, on the one hand, the, the role of the deep state and also corporate state capture, because uh, the, in, the, the, the politics of the interlacostal region, that is the Great Lakes region, uh, has always emerged as quite unique if you look at the post-colonial uh, discourse and the narrative of the post-colonial state. Why? Because the, 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 the interlacostal region, particularly uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, itself stands out as a, what I prefer to refer to as a company state. Lumumba, in this instance, was fighting against big companies with big interests, and these are global institutions. And that is what caused or iked, uh, and these states or these uh, in companies, global as they are, if you like, multinational companies, also have a profound influence and footprint in their home countries, America in particular, France, Belgium, and, 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 and Britain. So they tend to inf also influence the politics of the state and also their international relational politics. If you look at how they each have to deal with uh, the, the post-colony. So that is what I think played a, a, an important role in what we see as the demise of the Lumumba uh, state and the Lumumbist, all, uh, all, of, all of the Lumumbist. I, I think, I hope my brother Mguni is still there. Um, but let me go back to some of the things that I raised earlier on. If you remember, I talked about, I presented Zimbabwe as a, a captured state and a felonious state taken from the word felony. We all know what felony is. So Zimbabwe is a captured state in the felonious state. And I gave those five submissions as my observations in which I observed that uh, there is the existence of a hidden ethnic forecast of collective structure of power that surrounds and controls those in the executive authority of the state, which also in a way influences the social construction of the imaginations of the character and the identity of the person who should aspire for the highest office. In this instance, that the person who should aspire for the highest office uh, should be uh, should be should be someone who is should be someone who is uh, uh, shown. We have seen that in Zimbabwe, and as my brother Umoyo raised it uh, in the case of uh, how the MDC was born uh, with Gibson uh, Swanda being uh, pushed to become the vice president and Morgan Tsongrai becoming the president. We have seen this happening. This is not, uh, this is an open secret. So these are some of the things that we should acknowledge. And this is a product. Uh, this is an example of a captured of kept, of kept state how when the state is captured by an ethnic group, they will in the process underlie and also purvey a particular narrative, an ethnic uh, narrative with an ethnic interest. In Zimbabwe, it's called the Chinuchetu mentality. And within the opposition, it is the Wajira mentality. We have seen a lot of uh, intellectuals uh, in Zimbabwe uh, castigating anything and everyone from a Tabele land who will dare to raise uh, their head as it were to argue against, you know, this so-called triple uh, C and other such organizations from Matebele land. And um, I, I could even give another example uh, uh, closer home. We have, uh, uh, I don't know whether people have ever bothered to, uh, to ask why, for example, a radical, very principled, focused political leader like Jacob Ngarivume in Zimbabwe still fails to, to gain traction. Even when he was arrested with Hopewell, he was actually an afterthought, if not a footnote, in whenever people talked about those that are being incarcerated by the Nangagwa government. Why? Why is that so? This is a principled young man. Some of us uh, have known from when we were during our days as uh, student leaders in Zimbabwe. But why is he a footnote? Why is he not uh, gaining so much traction? The answer is very simple. He belongs to the minority. He is now, actually. 
So this is the Zimbabwean crisis. This is the Zimbabwean dilemma, the dilemma of state capture along ethnic lines, the patrimonial state. Now, going forward, I also talked about the, uh, the participation of the ruling party as a collective uh, of oligarchs. I, I suppose that also was talking about, when I raised the word, the idea of calling oligarchs, I was also bringing in the corporatization of even the so-called political ruling political party uh, in criminal economic uh, activities that are carried out with impunity and in collusion, I emphasized uh, earlier on uh, with the international institutions and systems. And I did say that, uh, given uh, the fact of I'm overseas, so there are certain things I cannot say. And so I, uh, but I wanted to emphasize that point. Um, and uh, I also talked about the, an osmosis between a historical, a historically conjured ethnic culture with its specificities, as in the case of the Mbuyane Handa narratives, the Sukiro narratives and other such uh, Shona symbols and cultural repertoires as vehicles of, uh, as it were, conveying and as it were, valorizing the narrative of Zimbabwe as a, as a state, as a, rather as a nation, which are empty. Uh, and I argue that that itself creates for us or presents to us the Jacobin narrative or Jacobin verbiage of an empty and, vac if you like, vacuous uh, narrative of nationhood. So these are some of the things that I, I, I highlighted earlier on. Still on that, I want to say a few things in response also. I have already started responding to my brother, uh, Dr. Hadeb, and I hope uh, he understands this, that uh, the reality of national belonging, I should say, since time immemorial, has been that citizenship by its nature, belonging, is not itself a given unless and until those who want to belong actually feel they are benefiting from the state. This is where one citizenship, national belonging, and the capture of the state is anchored. It is those that have captured the state that have, as it were, the, 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 the power arrogated to them through this ability to capture the state. They are able as well to also, as it were, accord you citizenship and allocate you resources that are due to you as a citizen. So national belonging is a form of state. And I want to, I want to present a, a bit of a controversial argument, which I always use, that national belonging is a form of state belonging uh, by its nature is supposed to be utilitarian. And I must emphasize that uh, earlier on, I argued that Zimbabwe is a, is a state and not a nation. Therefore, if you have the two, the two of them are totally different. One on the nation side, you are born into it. I argue from, uh, uh, I'm not as, uh, I don't want to belong and fall into these typologies of uh, primordialist, constructivist, ethno symbolist. Uh, Dr. Hadebe knows what I'm talking about. I don't want to belong to those. I am an African uh, post colonial thinker in this instance of the decolonial mode. And my argument is that. Uh, the nation state as we know it in Africa has the cultural homogeneity element. And then the state is itself, is itself a constructed structure. So this is where the notion of imagined comes in. But imagined in a, in a nation would still entail the fact of innateness. This is my view. So now uh, you are born in, in, into a nation, but, but are conscripted into the state. This is how I argue you are conscripted into belonging to a state. And that's why the state is maintained and secured with arms of war. I've always argued that. Even those that you call state leaders, our own state leaders, they come to you and me when they are, uh, you know, in this pretentious plebiscitary mode of an election. They come to you to argue for, or rather to ask for our votes. When they come to us, they are almost open and talking to us. But the moment we vote for them, they start moving around with the concourse of menacing looking men and women armed to teeth to protect them from you and me. That is the state. Because you are as part of society and society and the nation is an antibody to the state. This is my view. And in a nutshell, for the nation to keep your allegiance in that, in that regard because it is utilitarian, your citizenship is utilitarian. You must benefit from the state. 
And so for the nation to keep your allegiance following that violent process of state formation itself and the process of conscription itself that I call citizenship, it should first pretend to provide you with some kind of security. The state must provide, pretend to provide you with some kind of security and provide you with many other services and resources. And I argue that the latter in terms of the services is merely a form of bribery. The state must always bribe the citizens. And it's a form of bribery whose designs is to water the tree of nationalism as an ideology. Unfortunately, if you look at the case of Zimbabwe, the people who captured the state, those uh, ZANU-PF thugs and uh, as ethno uh, symbolists, uh, actually, uh, when they captured the state, they failed to ensure that all those forms of bribery exist in order to conjure belonging and citizenship as we see it in other parts of the world. In the UK, I will give an example. The state keeps bribing. You see, state belonging is, a is in flux. It's a continuous process. It, the state must ensure that it bribes its citizens to belong. Otherwise, citizens can easily secede. And secession does not necessarily moving, refer to moving boundaries. It could be belonging and attaching yourself to the state. So in the UK, you and me and others, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mbuni and Gala, the state constantly, when you are faced with a, a big crisis, comes to you and reminds you that it's available to attend to you. I will give you an example. When the pandemic COVID-19 started, I was overseas. I actually received a call from the embassy telling me that uh, as a British citizen, they are, they are, uh, you know, we are at your service. So they said that they will, at any moment, if I have a problem, I must call them, they will take me home. That's what, we, that's what I refer to as the nationalist bribery. The state's attempt to conjure, continuously conjure national belonging and, citizen, and, and citizenship. So that exists. But in Zimbabwe, what we saw, those who captured the state, the ethno symbolists, they instead preferred to use the path of violence to force everyone to belong. You either belonged or you were massacred in the Kugura on the genocide. So as a result, they did not create citizens they actually created victims. And a lot of people who call themselves Zimbabwe today do not realize that they have imbibed psychologically this concept of belonging, which has been infused and it's constantly hammered to them that you are Zimbabweans, even if it has no meaning to them and there is no utilitarian benefit to, uh, uh, that it comes with. Uh, they, will, they, have, they have embraced it but they still don't realize that they actually, they are actually victims of a state that has been captured. But allow me to raise other points that I think will help us to understand this whole notion of a state and state capture. What are the functions of a state anyway? There are six functions of a, rather six functions of, state, of a state that I would want to highlight. One is sovereign control of the, of, of the territory. The state must control the territory and of course secure it, including securing it from you as the citizen. If you happen tomorrow to say you don't want to belong there, that's why they call it treasonous. You see, we are having it in the UK. And then the already. second thing, the second uh, of the functions of the state is that there must be sovereign supervision through not necessarily ownership of the state or the, yeah, well, the state's resources, so-called nation's resources. Number three, there has to be effective and rational revenue extraction from uh, extraction rather from people that is through taxes, uh, goods and services. And the state also must have the number four, the state must have the capacity to build and maintain an adequate national infrastructure, roads, postal services, telephone services, railways, the health sector and so forth and so forth. But also the state number five must be able to, to have the capacity to render such basic services as uh, the education aspect, uh, housing, sanitation, and healthcare, which if you look at the case of Zimbabwe, it failed during COVID-19. Most African states were put to test by COVID-19. The pandemic actually exposed the post-colonial state. We were able to see 
who actually captured the state. And we were able to even witness the violence of the state that they captured when they could not fly to get treatment elsewhere. That's what I refer to as the violence of this, rather the violence of the state. We witnessed that. And number six, I also argue that uh, the state must also, as its function, have the capacity for governance and the maintenance of, 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 of rule of law and order. Well, we know that in the case of Zimbabwe, uh, when we talk about rule of law, it does not, we, we don't have it. We talk about, the, in actual effect in Zimbabwe, we have rule by law. We don't have rule of law. So these are some of the things I could have unpacked uh, with uh, more time. But uh, as a way also of engaging these in greater detail, responding to some of the questions that my brother Ohadebe raised, he said uh, one other point that he raised that if we have uh, in Africa, if what we have in Africa is not the ideal uh, of a nation, uh, if, the, if, not, if what we have is, is not the ideal nation, uh, would it be, what would it be? And uh, do, you, do we have an example of uh, a situation where the congruence between the uh, nation and the state exists? I could, give a, I could give a couple of examples. But before I do so, I want to also emphasize that the challenge we have in the post, in the, 20, in the 21st century, is that uh, if you go historically, you will realize the way examples, if you look at the, the case of uh, uh, Garibald and Manzin in Italy, uh, you know, in the 1860s to the 1890s, and even the idea of the, uh, you know, the rise of the principalities in uh, the case of uh, Otto van Bismarck and others, those were examples that we had then, that they had then. Now, if we come closer home in the 21st century, the examples we can think of are the example of Israel. It is one example where the state is conflated with the nation and they, and I'm taking this from, the, from one of our colleagues, uh, Hastings, the one who wrote the book, Banal Nationalism. Uh, he gives the example of, nationalism, of, of Israel as an example of, uh, um, of, of, of where the compound of the nation and the, uh, and the state exists. Um, it is difficult then to imagine Italy now, if you look at the, from the Mazinian period to now and argue that it could still be another example because we already have a problem of Sicily, which wants to break away. I would have also given the example of France, but it is now becoming a problem because already France is uh, the other uh, part of France that is uh, the southern part of France that wants to break away. So I cannot even give the example of uh, uh, states like Belgium and others because even states like no Norway have the other parts, particularly in the northern part where uh, my brother Dr. Hadev studied. Uh, they have a problem. If you look at the case of the far north, uh, they actually are entertaining the idea of breaking away. Um, those, are, I should say, Israel stands out uh, because it has been maintained through violence. Violence as a, as, as a territorially bounded state, but within the state, I should say, uh, it still works to a certain extent. Um, Dr. Hadeb also talked about, uh, he said, how about the idea of multinational, of a multinational state? That's a charming idea. We could have had uh, the idea of a, a multinational state. I, at some point, some time ago, I think some 10 years ago, I argued when I was in a discussion with Dr. Hadeb and also in one of my papers that I wrote, that instead of America and the Western world selling to Africa the notion of democracy, its ethos, and everything that comes with it, its trappings. They should have sold, particularly America, the idea of a federal state, how a federal state could run because America has a federal state and it's running following the war they, they had, which then unified the state and they came up with a, a, a federal government. They should have actually sold this idea to Africa. Possibly post-colonial Africa would have worked. It is then that I argued we could have uh, witnessed the rise of multi uh, of multinational uh, of a multinational state. Uh, we could have had that, but again, when I look at most of our post-colonial, or rather, when I look at most of those so-called departed colonialists where they came from, the former colonizers, 
UK is on the brink of collapse. Just yesterday, you witnessed that uh, signing of that uh, bill, uh, which actually engages the, uh, the Northern Islanders and allows them to, to a certain extent to begin to entertain the idea of breaking away, not to mention that the Welsh for a long time have always been wanting to break away and they do not even want to recognize the queen. The queen who is a Scottish queen by design and the Scottish want to break away too. So already Britain is on the brink, on the brink rather of collapsing. So I am arguing that if Britain is on the brink of collapsing and yet it created these structures whose contours we still want to follow to this extent today, why are we so pedantic to the extent that we want to keep these structures that even Britain themselves, the British themselves that had colonized us are actually beginning to do away with. Very soon, Scotland is going. We know that the Northern, Northern Ireland is obviously on the brink. We know that the Welsh are on the brink. So the idea of a multinational state in Africa is too late. This is my argument. Uh, and even the idea of a federal project in Africa, I argued in one of my works on the ticklish subject of uh, uh, devolution, that it is talking about a federal project and even devolution in post-colonial Africa, particularly Zimbabwe now, is like administering a drug to a, a patient who is already on their deathbed. That drug might actually collapse them and collapse their system. Zimbabwe is already on the brink, whether people like it or not. I want to also to argue then that I don't know whether a lot of people have observed this, but I want to argue that often when ZANU-PF sends some of its uh, uh, ideologues, people like Mtswangwa and others, uh, Chinamasa, they often argue that Zimbabwe is ours. We formed it, we liberated it. If you want it, go and fight for yours. That actually is a very important statement that they will be making. Because Zimbabwe is itself a product of, 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 of nationalist and liberation uh, fighters of which those uh, people are the people that actually captured the state. They mooted it, imagined it, and through praxis constructed it, ZANU did it. That's why they have had to construct it as a successor state to the Mutapa state, as I argued, following that they even had as its underlying ethos, a patrimonial autocracy created. Now with all that, when ZANU argues that this is our state, anyone who is actually fighting to liberate Zimbabwe must understand that they are actually fighting for something that is not theirs. It is time people begin to re-envision or to begin to unthink the Zimbabwe they think they have in their mindset. A radical ethos is necessary there. This is the argument I am raising. Uh, my brother Hadebe also uh, talked about the attempt to push to unite Zimbabwe movement. He said the attempt, oh, he talked about, uh, he asked why during the liberation struggle we witnessed uh, the attempt to cause liberation movements in Zimbabwe to unite and why actually the African Union uh, was pushing for that and uh, why, why there was so much pressure from the African Union. Uh, well, I must begin by saying, those at the helm of the African Union at the time, who were considered as the founding fathers and leading uh, you know, figures, founding fathers and leading figures, people like Ahmed Seko Tore, Hefebweni of La Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Kwame Nkrumah uh, of Ghana, and Mwalimu Nyerere. These believed in the notion that the whole idea of ethnicity itself was created and constructed, or I should say constructed by uh, the departing colonialists. So when Zimbabweans were fighting the liber in the liberation struggle, on the one hand being Zapu, on the other hand uh, being uh, rather Zanla and, uh, and, and Zebra, they felt that the ethnic divisions were actually not going to lead to the birth of a, a unified state. So they were pushing because their argument was, uh, we were created, we were caused rather, rather to divide ourselves along ethnic lines. Therefore, let us imagine that these ethnic lines are constructed by the departing colonialists, let's do away with them. Which is why you will find that people like uh, uh, Amilcar Cabral, uh, 
in his book, Return to the Source, argued so much, so much by saying for the nation to live, the tribe must die because they believed so strongly that the tribe was itself an antithesis to the, uh, uh, the entire nationalist uh, ethos of the liberation struggle. And this is where I, I, I argue from a, a, an ethnic minority perspective to say, no one, including Joshua Nkomo and others, asked those who were arguing like that because Amilka Cabral and, uh, Amilka Cabral and others actually came from uh, ethnic minor, uh, majorities, including uh, Nkrumah, including even Nyerere, who later on destroyed the whole idea of ethnicity in, 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 in Tanzania. But Ahmed, Se uh, Ahmed Sekotore uh, and others, all of them, they came from the ethnic majorities. No one from the ethnic man minorities asked these guys why it is that they are pushing for the narrative that says for the nation to leave, the tribe must die, and whose tribe must be brutally massacred. And yet, all post-colonial states witnessed the brutal massacre of ethnic mi minorities to cause submission and to cause their victimhood as subjects. In other words, subjugation and, subject and subjectification. So if you look at the case of Zimbabwe, I will argue that what we witnessed with the rise of uh, Kukuraundi or the, you know, the birth of Zimbabwe, Kukuraundi genocide itself emerges as an example of what I will argue is the confirmation of a state capture by an ethnic minority, or rather an ethnic majority Shona nationalist pursuing a Shona nationalist narrative on the one hand, also as a, on the other hand, as a, I will argue, as a, as a form of uh, the brutal massacre of the ethnic, the tribe that must die for the nation to live. This is what we witness. So all these things are actually confirming the challenge of the state being captured. Yes, the state gets captured. We witness the Will of El scandal and many other uh, forms or examples uh, that showed that the state had been captured by a particular group of uh, people who obviously were going through the process of being oligarchs, turned into oligarchs. And it is then that the deep state emerges. But we must understand the deep, the deep state was there even during the liberation struggle, there was. And I must also emphasize that if Joshua Ngomo had captured the state, there was going to be a deep state. We have witnessed, and I'm going to hazard the examples of Narans and others, the Indian community that of course occupied certain, you know, conclaves within uh, uh, Bulawayo and, 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 and occupying uh, specific uh, uh, economic zones. Those could have easily been turned into, you know, structures of the deep state that could have influenced the state if it had been captured by the Zipra and ultimately Zapu. But I want to hazard then that the deep state captured by these ethno symbolists, Shona nationalists in Zanu, became one where they it was accepted by the international, the international institutions, we all know that. We saw the international institutions accepting Mugabe, including giving him uh, awards, Mugabe being knighted and others, including the Pope visiting Zimbabwe in 1987, by the way. So that itself marked the acceptance of the state capture by this group, which had pretentiously presented itself as a nationalist a group when in fact it was actually pursuing Shona nationalism and they accepted it at an international, an international level and started trading with it. The, the Breton Woods companies engaged them. Uh, I'm talking about IMF, World Bank and everyone. They, they, they worked with them. They even uh, gave them uh, lines of credit. All this shows how they were accepted, which is what I talked about earlier on is uh, about the six strictures of a, a felonious state. Now the deep state gradually was getting anchored. And what did ZANU do? ZANU itself embarked on what I also argue is cutter deployment. When they captured the institutions of the state, turned all the institutions of the state into ZANU, for example, the military, and even went on after capturing the military, ensuring that their cutters were deployed there 
are actually schooled in the ways of, the, of statecraft, which is what we have now. So what you see, or what we witnessed in 2007 when the state ultimately, or rather, ZANU successionist politics imploded, was the return of the deployed culture, cadres uh, back to the fold to want to actually lead ZAN because they had been deployed. And uh, the military, it's, as we know it, uh, was actually not a, a, a state institution as it's supposed to be, but it was actually an ethnocized state institution led by ZANU, if like ZANU fight. Even our brothers who actually work and uh, submit to the ethos of the military as uh, professional soldiers actually did not even realize that they are actually part of ZANU, that they're actually part of the ruling party. So what we witnessed in 2007 was an implosion, which actually was, a, I should say, an aha moment, you know, for every one of us to actually begin to realize where ZANU's power lay for a long time. It was actually in the repressive state apparatus, the army, the state intelligence, and the police and others. That's what happened. So the deep state, had for a long time been there and actually keeping these institutions not in check, but fueled so that they, man, they are maintained for the good of ZANU-PF, ZANU-PF, which had itself conflated itself rather, if you like, uh, with the state uh, and it become the state. I mean, uh, I will give an example, Ungala, here that uh, one of the things that we found interesting over the years, I witnessed this when I was uh, teaching at NAST and uh, when I was a student in Zim at, at the University of Zimbabwe, and later on when I was uh, teaching overseas. Uh, whenever ZANU had uh, held its uh, ZANU PF Congress at the end of the year, did you, not, did you know that everyone, including even the citizens who hate ZANU, people from Matebeleland who are victims of ZANU, they got interested in knowing what was deliberated on the discussions, the thought lines within the ZANU conclaves, including who has been appointed to what position in the Politburo of ZANU, which actually meant that the entire state and the society, which is an antibody to the state, had been ZANUized. This is what we witnessed in Zimbabwe. It was this fruit and sleep that we lived in. And people continue to, to this day, Zimbabweans call, people call themselves Zimbabwean. It's a fruit and sleep. They are actually not even Zimbabweans. They are being denied everything because the ZANU PF that captured the state did so, even when they came during to Gukuraundi, they came to Matebeleland. Their narrative was that we are atoning for the sins that your four bearers committed on our people, blah, 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 and we're doing this on behalf of our children who will take over the state and so forth and so forth. And we see this in the CC, Triple C, and other uh, movements. Even we saw it in the MDC during Fangrai's time and so forth that uh, the Chinuchetu mentality was already there. We see this. But then a lot of people from Adebelin would still want to argue that they're Zimbabweans by birth. And a number of them were even born beyond Zimbabwe, before Zimbabwe was born but they still call themselves Zimbabweans. You have someone who was born in the 1970s when Zimbabwe was, before Zimbabwe was born and now wanting to identify with Zimbabwe as their state. How crazy can this be? So the idea of the deep state, Nkala, let me just the conclude. conclude. Okay. Yes, the idea of the deep state is such that even those that captured the, or rather those that are actually said to have captured the state now, are, as Dr. Amguni argued, are in, are in shackle rather in shekels of uh, having been or be, having become victims of what they created the structure they created they are actually beneficiaries of it uh, you know this the whole idea of the taguires and others these are zanu pf children zanu pf created its own children empowered them gave them the lines of communication with international uh, systems the financial systems so that they will continue to plow back uh, at home and as they plow back, we call it the deep state. But if you, if you look at it, it is giving ZANU a lifeline. It is giving these ethno symbols a lifeline. Even if Nangakwa is removed today, Chiwenga takes over or whoever takes over or my good friend Nelson Chamisa takes over, that lifeline has already been granted. What we have to do 
is to imagine something that will actually cause a rapture to that lifeline. I, I, I'm yet to imagine it. I'm yet to see how we could uh, plan it. But Zimbabwe as it is today was configured, or if you like, mooted, imagined, configured as praxis by ZANU-PF. And the children of ZANU-PF masquerading in all forms and all manner of structures you can think of, including triple C, uh, stand to be beneficiaries of the structure that was created then and captured them. And they will continue to capture until we actually deconstruct it. If there is anyone here who wants to argue that ZANU, uh, whatever they did uh, was wrong and everything, they must come out clearly and say, when they argue that they are doing it on their behalf, they were wrong too. You cannot accuse me a victim for actually saying these things. And I, I'm not, I'm an academic uh, Nkala. I am not a, demo, a, a, diplo, a diplomat, so I'm not here to, to talk diplomats. I'm here as an academic to spell out things as they are. So this is what we have uh, uh, seen. So I've already talked about the- Thanks very much. Um, I, I will ask uh, Dr. Hadebe to reflect on your points. However, for now, I would like to move on a little bit uh, and ask this question. Uh, is state capture a bad thing? Um, what are its negative consequences? Uh, that question, I'm, 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 I'm posing it to Dr. Njovu, then I will pose the same question to Mr. Moore. Over to you, Dr. Njovu. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Babunkala. It's a very interesting and a tricky question at the same time. Uh, the question says, is it a bad thing? And is there a time when it is a good thing? Right. Um, as Dr. Mtlanga highlighted earlier, there is no state that is not captured. It is rather a question of degree uh, so, so between two states, you are not looking at the nature of the capture, but you are looking at the degree. Now, uh, thinking then in terms of whether it can at one point be good or at one point be bad, I think it's all about uh, coming back to, 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 to the issue that I spoke about earlier on, the issue of uh, this imaginary agreement uh, between the people and the, the state. Uh, 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 in fact, Dr. Mtlanga mentioned the six, I, I'm sure, six functions of the state. And uh, still, uh, that was expressive in a way of uh, this imaginary contract between the people and those that, that govern. So depending then on uh, how uh, the, 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 that relationship is functioning. Maybe we can go back to look at why do we have a state in the first place? Why did people decide at some point? Maybe somebody might say they never decided, but uh, somehow everybody finds themselves belonging to some polity or some structure or organization one way or the other. And the question is, what is the rationale for belonging to that kind of uh, an institution that then brings us to the issue of uh, you know the state of nature where somebody would say before uh, uh, that is a pre-state uh, uh, society uh, life is brutal and short in other words there are no rules it's the law of the jungle it's survival of the fittest and so because without the state we then have this uh, survival of the fittest it then goes without saying that it becomes necessary to submit yourself to an authority so that it can control the territory, maintain that sovereignty, deploy the army and the police to ensure that there is, a, there is safety for everybody. So in the case of a well-structured and well-designed state where you find that the, 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 while the, the state itself pursues its own 
interest of you know enjoying that hegemony over the, the land and over the people it also profess that protection that people uh, uh, require so when that relationship works in such a way that it is mutually beneficial to all to both parties i would say then uh, to that to that extent yes capture is to some extent acceptable but again maybe taking it a little bit further to say State, state capture, you know, in its conceptualizations, as Dr. Hadebe did refer to its history in connection with the, the collapsing communist, that Soviet Union and the emergence of new states in the former Soviet bloc. You, you find that it is systemic corruption. It is systemic decay in the institutions of, of, of government to the point that the, the people who are not exactly, you know, powerful within the context of society find themselves living very uh, uh, precariously. Because you see, once there is that corruption, which, you know, erodes the whole fabric of, of, of the, the state institutions, then the level of protection that is expected from those institutions is no longer something that you can rely upon. So on that note, state capture in its extreme forms is not desirable, particularly because then we are looking at how the interests of a few oligarchs, a few select, are now having to prevail. You find, as you would have in the, in the example of South Africa, where the Gupta family it becomes so accessible to, to the cabinet that it was now beginning to, you know, directly influence policy and even get so involved in the appointment of uh, functionaries, even cabinet posts. For instance, the story of how they were offering a cabinet posts to the likes of Mkrebisi Jonasi, Jonasi rather, would actually speak of the extent of the rot and the decay and how everybody else had become vulnerable, if one would say. Uh, but again, maybe taking it historically, you notice as somebody, I think it was uh, uh, Dr. Mguni who highlighted the fact that it is traceable back to the colonial system. So in a way, the state has always been captured. But as I said, it's a question of extent. At some point, say in Rhodesia, the state was captured, but people were still able to pursue lives and live decently. Even in early Zimbabwe, life, uh, the state was captured, but there was some level of decency. But come now to, 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 to these extreme scenarios that we have where almost everybody, including the former uh, beneficiaries of that captured uh, state, if one could talk in terms of ethnicity and how a certain ethnic group had benefited at some point, we now can come to a point where not anybody at all is enjoying even any decency that is as associated with being human. Because if you look at the people in Zimbabwe across the spectrum, they have been dehumanized. So in that sense, I would say state capture is something to be closely watched and to be, dis I mean, to be, to, to be discouraged. Because at each extreme point, it impoverishes, it diminishes humanity, and it makes everybody a pale shadow of who they ought to be. I would like to end it Very on nice. that. All right, okay. Uh, um, let me come to you. Uh, is uh, state capture a as, bad thing? As, as um, Obawinjo has alluded to the fact that uh, almost all states are captured. Um, I also want to draw from Obawinjo uh, when he actually mentioned um, is something that's probably is hereditary in the sense that. Um, uh, it was created uh, from the Berlin Conference where they uh, developed such kind of systems. Uh, when they came with the divide tactics, which, um, now we inherited so by um, the post-colonial governments. <clears throat> where we see um, what is happening right now is a reflection of the colonial era and then when you look at it from either it's a good thing or it's a bad thing, I, I, I don't believe 
it can be a good thing in the sense um, of how uh, Dr. Skavate explained uh, this whole uh, uh, on. Look at it that um, somehow, if we go back to the creation of each and every human being, we are innately given a right to belong. And for that reason, it is uh, it becomes totally wrong uh, for each uh, human being to come to to the control of another human being, and then all of a sudden their life is changed or directed to a certain direction by a certain individual, not only for their benefit, uh, but for the benefit of who is the captor at the time. So in this sense, I'm looking at uh, uh, the, the, the bad part of the state capture as we are talking right now, because it keeps people in a roller coaster environment or movement whereby we're not going anywhere. If we look at it from uh, the state capture that we have uh, just been describing, especially from the Zimbabwe point of view, you'll discover that uh, by just disadvantaging the people of Matebele land, you're actually disadvantaging the whole of Zimbabwe, as Dr. Ali was saying, which not everyone, I mean, like everyone in Zimbabwe is dehumanized. You know, it, it is that element <clears throat> that they tried to use, which was used by the majority uh, 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 colonial rulers at the time where they were making sure that uh, many other people do not have access to resources, but they themselves and their masters. <clears throat> so by so doing that, as much as we are looking at the ethno-based uh, uh, capture, we are also looking at it that whatever it is that they are doing uh, to Matemelele, to say they do not want them to access any resources or to develop or to develop their areas, that impacts as well to a whole nation as Zimbabwe. This brings us to a point that uh, for me to, to say I belong to Zimbabwe, I need to feel and have those benefits and be able to like uh, proudly say, really, I do belong. <clears throat> I'm sure Uto Daskabate said it as to how uh, in Europe or in the UK, they actually do in following up and buying or in a way bribing people to, to feel that they really belong to the country. That's, that's not what you are finding in Zimbabwe. So the bad part of it is here, if, if, if we go back to what is happening right now, systematically, uh, go to the prison, I mean, to the jails right now and see what is happening. Just go to any police station. They are still using those old type of colonial systems or colonial tools that were used to suppress and also uh, disadvantage black people. The same government of Zimbabwe has adopted that and inherited it, and they are using it. Go, go, go to, 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 to the prisons right now. Look at the life there. It's dehumanizing. No one wants to be in that jail. Even they, the government itself, even they, the leaders themselves, they wouldn't want to stay a single hour or a minute in jail because they know how dehumanizing that environment is. And then you look at using that as a means to deal with anyone who is in opposition. So. In such a situation, you 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 realize that a uh, such colonial era still exists today, but now is the government a uh, black to black uh, 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 colonialism whereby uh, some black people are deprived of certain opportunities, and then at the end of the day they feel they don't really belong to a certain state. Hence, it goes back to what when we as MRP are standing up and saying. Why should we secede from Zimbabwe? It becomes a question where by other people say, why do you want to secede? And then some people will argue and say, but we all belong to Zimbabwe. But the question is, do we belong to Zimbabwe? That's the first question. If I am dehumanized and then I don't feel like I have that kind of a belonging, it goes back to the same uh, declarations for human rights according to the UN Charter that each and every person has a right to secede or each and every person has a right to self-determine themselves depending on the circumstances that they are being exposed to. So you look at it, the state capture in Zimbabwe has failed to create a nation. And then by so doing, it has created confusion, which now Zimbabwe is in the brink of breaking down because uh, there is a lot of confusion and a lot of political tumor that is ongoing. And to me, it's a sign that they have failed to build a nation. They have just continued to, to maintain that kind of a, a colonial system that was used to oppress other people. But now they are dealing with other black people uh, in the same uh, degree. So to me, I don't think uh, in a, a very probable situation, say, we see is that when you look at it, it definitely end of the day is benefiting quite a few people. It is not benefiting almost everyone. 
in this particular, when we come to Zimbabwe, we are realizing that the people of Matabele are disadvantaged, and we cannot be running away and trying to trivialize those issues and be uh, 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 too politically correct about it. What I like about you, Dr. Skabat is that he's blunt to the point academically, of which those are facts that you cannot have against, because it's the truth that is there, that is uh, emphasized. But sometimes we try to be politically correct because when we're talking of state capture, it is not without the mention of politics. Because for, for, for Matemelele to develop, there is a need for a political power. But the political power has been weaved away from us and has been taken away from us. We point that we're not even able to raise a voice. Whenever you try to raise a voice, you are now uh, regarded as a face who is dissenting or who is opposing the government. Even right now, the people of Matemelele, when they stand up to speak against all the hills, they are the ones that are now able to be tribal. But am I tribal when I am actually uh, pushing for self-determination to say, I don't feel like I am, I, am, I, I, I am welcome to this state. Why am I not protected? If you look at it, if Zimbabwe was really serious about a developing a nation, why is it even in Zimbabwe there is not even a single policy that protects minority groups? When it comes to the economy, when it comes to social constructs and everything, there is not even a single policy. Whether it's in employment or whatever is happening, there is no way where they can say, okay, let this uh, sector be reserved for the indigenous people, for the people of that particular region. There is, there is not even a single, they are not even interested in crafting such, such kind of laws. And then I look at it and say, every time what they try to do is to emphasize that Zimbabwe is a unitary state. But then ask yourself, how, how unitary? Zimbabwe is. That was just that piece of a document in 1987 whereby uh, they tried to unite the two factions that were fighting. When actually Nkomo saw that the people of Matemelele was being, were being massacred and it was going to go too far, and then Nkomo had to fight it and to say, okay, the only thing that can do this is try to forge a unity. But look, how, to, how did that unity benefit as the people of Matemelele? Not at all. Well, it did benefit anything. Still, the capture continued. You see now. So, we are looking at all these situations and we are simply saying, what is happening in Zimbabwe is so bad. And it has come to a point whereby it is on the brink of breaking. And I believe that the only solution to this, it is only going to restart everything from scratch. Uh, Mr. Moyo, um, let, let me come to Dr. Hatev. Um, I think in the interest of time, uh, we need to conclude now. Uh, we have been here for two hours or so. Uh, Dr. Uh, Hattel, if you could uh, maybe reflect on what uh, Dr. Skabate has said uh, in answering your questions. And in the process, if you can give us your ideas in terms of what can be done uh, to prevent uh, state capture? Thank you, thank you, Babunkala. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Skavate is now my own teacher. I, I am your <laughs> student because I've been enjoying, I've been enjoying and, and learning a lot and seeing the advantage of age. Now I can benefit from those who are still steeped in academic rigor and, and research. I think it's very impressive. Uh, I, I wouldn't go further. I, I liked it, especially the point when you say the concept or the idea of a multinational state is too late. So you say that of federalism and devolution in Zimbabwe are rather too late. I think I agree with you 100% on that one. Taking on that note, and uh, you ask uh, Babunkala uh, on, on what needs to be done, I think if we take the capture, as Dr. Skabati outlined, that in the Zimbabwean context, we are uh, captured by an, an, an ethnic nationalist chauvinist uh, group, I think then we have the right uh, to exercise self-determination. I think that is, that is clear. And I think all of us here will agree, even if we might term it differently. We, we have the right to exist as well, a, a right that we don't need to beg it from anyone, a right to exist that we mustn't uh, ask from anyone. 
but a right that we think by all standards we're entitled to. I think we have suffered a lot. We've been discriminated a lot. We've been abused a lot. We have been marginalized beyond uh, the weight. So I think it's time for self-determination and that's the only way we can answer to the ethnic capture of the Zimbabwe state. I thank you, colleagues. Oh, thanks, thanks, thanks very much. Dealing with um, uh, state capture, what measures could be implemented or could be put in place? Oh, thank you very much. I, I would echo what Dr. Hartebe just said in line with the, 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 the main argument that has been advanced tonight by uh, Dr. Mtlanga um, as well as Babu uh, Moyo uh, Velile and so on that. You see, when there is this issue of ethnic domination and uh, hegemony of some kind, uh, where you've endured it for more than four decades and there doesn't seem to be an end in sight, it may just be up that you, 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 you go ahead and pursue self-determination. But maybe as, as, as we look at this, I would like to sound a, a word of caution again to say, you see, we're talking about structural issues here. Sometimes we may just transfer a problem from one generation to the next. Because the main, I, the main question has been, is Zimbabwe captured? Is capture a good thing? Is this something to be entertained? I, I think maybe whilst thinking about uh, self-determination and uh, the emergence of a new state uh, configured in whatever form, uh, there should then be a, a foundation laid uh, regarding prevention of, of capture of the new uh, state that would arise from, you know, from that, that secession. Because you see, what we see are issues that are structural uh, that seem to take away agency from those that participate as Babural uh, from uh, say. So in order to then uh, empower those that will take over uh, in the new state that is yet to be uh, constructed and so on, there should be guidelines, very strict guidelines that take us back to the issue of uh, the, the drawing of this social, uh, con con I mean, social contract that foundation, which seems to have been lacking in Zimbabwe from the very word go, because there doesn't seem to have been an agreement from the word go in terms of what this Zimbabwe was going to be. Everybody just got excited and started singing songs in 1980 when independence was purportedly given, but uh, nobody seemed, or very few people seemed to have an idea what this new Zimbabwe was going to be probably those at the top like Mugabe and others had their own ideas up the sleeve. So to avoid that, then we must have a social contract drawn long beforehand, an ideological foundation for this new uh, state that we are envisioning for ourselves and for posterity. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Dr. Skabat, uh, same question to you. Um, I take it that the question that you asked is, uh, is state capture bad or a good thing? Uh, how, how or how to deal with state capture? What measures ah. uh, can be put in place? For? Ah, okay. Uh, I will answer, I will, I, will, I will begin by first going to the idea of uh, whether the state capture is bad, uh, good or bad, and quickly, just quickly. Oh, okay, that's fine. Yeah, uh, well, it depends on where you stand. It depends on where you where you are. If you look at during the, as uh, uh, Dr. Andlov uh, was saying, uh, including Dr. Hatebe, Luabu uh, Moy, if you look at Zimbabwe at its birth, the, Europh the euphoric stunts that we witnessed, those of us who were born at the time and were already aware of what was happening around us then, you will be able to tell that it all depends on where, or it all depends on where, where, you, where you stand. Remember, uh, other people, when, when other people were, say, were singing, Vam Gabe Vazotonga, you and me and the rest of us from Atebelele, 
were looking for places to hide in the bushes. I remember even as a young child telling, trying to suggest to my father how we should try to hide in the bushes where we used, where I used to tend my, well, you know, the goats and cattle. So that tells us the problem of state capture in post-colonial Africa. So if you ask me whether state capture is good or bad, I will say, if you look at the case for also of South Africa, South Africans uh, celebrated it when they got independence. Today, they are actually suffering and languishing in the darkness that's brought about by uh, what they call it, uh, this Lord, shedding. Lord shedding. Whereas in Zimbabwe, those who at one time marched and carried out placards saying, Pamberine Kukuraundi, we wish the people of Matebeleland well, forgot that Owen Zupiri Lopanda, Kuvame Women's. They even forgot that when they were celebrating what they called Zimbabwe as the bread basket, with some of us not even seeing the basket of it, there will come a time when there is no basket even for them, for the bread that they were talking about. So it depends on where you stand. Coming to uh, the I issue of that you raised, uh, the way forward, I want to begin in answering the way forward and in conclusion. Yeah. I say, you see, when you see, there is a statement that says, when you see a frog jumping in broad daylight, you must know that something is after its life. That is a very poignant statement. I am a, decontra I'm a deconstructionist uh, in, uh, by, uh, I think, upbringing and also uh, training. If the state is captured and it is, I argued it's, it's utilitarian, if it is not benefit by that, I mean, it's, it should be benefit, beneficiary to you as a, as a citizen. If you are not benefiting from it, there is no need to identify with something that you are not benefiting from. Even in a marriage situation, if it is not benefiting you, why are you still there? It is the same as this. Uh, belonging to a state, the state must benefit you. If it is not, it must explode. It must, it must be deconstructed. Why benefiting from a structure that was created to benefit others and you are left out? It is time that I argue and support the views that have been raised by my brothers here, Dr. Hadewe and uh, Dr. Njovu uh, and Uba Bumol, that it is then that people should begin not only to toy, but to put into practice the idea of self-determination. After all, your humanity is a right. You do not owe it to anyone. It is yours, it's your right. You must demand it. No one actually owes you your humanity unless and until you demand it. It's time. And this is where I have always told the people from Matebeleland that start envisioning your future because Zimbabwe has failed you. And there is no way Zimbabwe will benefit you if you sit down and analyze it closely. There is no Zimbabwe that will benefit you. Because even the children of Zimbabwe who are beneficiaries of Zimbabwe today do not even have their imagination, their perspective. They do not have you in their perspective. They live, as I argued, everyone, including yourself as the victim, you live within the prism of what I call the food and sleep. That's what Dr. Moy was talking about. The structural imagination, it's a constructed structural imagination of belonging that you as Zimbabwean and as a citizen, your agents and part of the whole ideation process and the moment of it, when in fact, the moment of it is always violent to you. How then do you want to live in a violent moment perpetually and for the rest of your time until Jesus comes without actually seeking to change it? Don't you think that itself is ungodly? I think it is. And let me say, Gala, post-colonial states by their nature were not designed to attend to, in, to the interests of the minorities. That's my conclusion. All post-colonial states, if you sit down and look at them, the interests of the majorities of the of the majorities trumped everything because when they were fighting, they fought for what they called majority rule. So the interests of even the my, uh, ethnic minorities among their black folk were not catered for in their ethos. 
except possibly South Africa, because when they negotiated in South Africa during Codesa, those who even negotiated uh, from the side of the black majority Mandela and the rest were still languishing in the moment and the mindset of opposition. They saw themselves as the opposition. They did not imagine themselves as the future leaders. So they negotiated as uh, the subjugated, the underlings. Whereas those who were in the mold of the departing uh, colonizers negotiated knowing that they are creating structures that will protect their interests when they have departed, the, uh, when they have left uh, those offices. So I argue post-colonial states by their nature were not designed to attend to the interests of the minorities. And that's what you see in Zimbabwe. And that's why Zimbabwe is a captured state. I think we need a, we, we, we need a lecture on this whole discourse of nationalism, Zimbabwe, uh, the ethnocized state and so forth in the future. Thank you so much, Nkata. Okay. No, thank, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Skabati. Thanks a lot. Um, and, and all these, uh, 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 Sizozama futu kutima siluenza lulu shelo next time. Sitinge nshangoti zonke. Nabako na ali babe kona. Kutu wagi banzi mungu tulagana angisho. Kutu wagi hai sizozama tipati nguweza na babe kona. Baba baba skulumeli. Eh, asbongi kakulu eh, asiti uma ekona opisu uti even as Lotina, eh, Gupanilam, Natabula, then was as far like. I'm a fellow panelist, you go pay like Nabuch. See a bong of a damning bong for the opportunity you gave us. You won't believe it. I am actually in the next five minutes, I'm leaving for the airport. So, <laughs> thank you so much, Nabonga. Cool. It was um, uh, very beneficial. So, uh, when we come from political angle and then we get cut um, it, it really nourishes the whole thing. And I'm so thankful for, for, for this interface. I really learned a lot, uh, indeed, a lot that I learned. Sabon Gakula, my participants are at a corner, those and Asa, Zara, and I will comment about it. Yeah, I believe you know, totally Sagakulu done. Siabong, eh, Babanjo? Eh, Angina, our money, Yabonga, Kulu, Tubang, Bonga, my panelists, way to really say Babus Gabate, a Babu Hate, a Babu Uvenile Moyo, Babungala, forever being there. No babo um good, as a sugar hamba, Gokshesh, as pong any tuba. Good night, God bless you all. See a bong and a cool, a spong and a cool ama panelist to a spong and ama participants, and as our niggas hang it tuba, a spong and a bonka bala lel in a babu gale, be material broadcasting corporation. A ikamung tulanogankala, neti kum. This is my Matilda Casting Corporation, inspired by the Spire.